Hello, everybody. My name is Dr. Christophe Fauger. I'm a professor of economics and finance, and welcome to Mastering Money. This is part four, mindfulness and finance. Lecture number 12, the brain, mindlessness, emotions, the basic instincts of finance and what mindfulness can do for you. So let's start with the learning goals for this presentation. First, we're going to look at uh, neuro neurology and how the brain is processing information and emotions. Then we're going to take stock of what mindlessness is. And finally, take a look at your brain on fear. So how does the brain process reality? That's the first question. So let's do this little test. How many F's do you see in this paragraph? Just going to give you a few seconds. OK, ready? So this is the answer. Did you see the six F's? Now, many people will see only three F's. That's what happened to me. Uh, but there are six. And actually, if you look at the preceding slides, you may even have seen seven from the questions itself. Another example. Now, what do you see in that picture? I'll give you a few seconds. Now, you may not see it right away, but once you're told what it is, the head of a cow, right here, the eyes, right here, the nose, the ears, then you can't help but actually see a cow every time you look at this picture. Another example. This is a famous example. A couple of years ago on the internet, there was a debate about what colors, colors plural, are this dress. Some people saw it as blue and dark gray or black, with the stripes being black. Some other people saw it as gold, white and gold. So white tissue with gold stripes. What color do you see? And that's a debate that was never really answered because uh, the person who uh, took the picture never really was clear about uh, what colors these were. But there was a huge debate about this. And the brain will do something funny because of the uh, background and the sunny background. The camera is actually um, uh, darkening the, the, the foreground and it, it may look like this uh, dress is blue but if the brain corrects for that effect it will uh, it will uh, tell uh, itself that the, the color of the of the cloth is actually white now let's look at these lines are these horizontal lines straight now if you actually take a ruler and draw a straight line across, you're going to see that those lines are straight. But the brain makes it look like they are crooked. Another test, there actually are 12 dots in this particular graph. Are you able to see them all at once? Give you a few seconds. Well, it turns out it's impossible to see them all at once. You may see four at once, but not the 12. So what's really going on? These are really many examples of the limitations of the brain to handle li literally millions of bits of information that are coming to the brain through the sensory system. Not only the information that our senses uh, receive sometimes is deficient, but the information um, that they receive as best they can, and the and the brain uh, and the senses don't uh, do often a good job uh, to uh, see what is actually or, or feel what is actually going on out there. So most often our senses are making guesses uh, about surrounding information, and we will often perceive what we expect to see 
and even what we want to see rather than what is actually there. An example of the black dots, what you have here is uh, an, uh, a, a documented effect called lateral inhibition in which uh, if several neurons are activated uh, and they are locating on a geospatial uh, framework um, objects, the, um, the neurons on the periphery will not be as sensitive um, because many of them are activated. And by contrast, if only one was activated, uh, the neuron would be more sensitive. That's why the visual cortex doesn't, doesn't see all of the action on this, on this square. So let's try another experiment. Please add these numbers out loud with me. 1,000, 1,040, 2,040, 2,070, 3,070, 3,090, 4,090, and if you said 5,000, which is what most people say, that was the wrong answer. The right answer is 4,100. And this just because it's another example of the brain taking shortcuts and being on automatic pilot. Let's try this other experiment. Can you say the word silk with me 10 times as quickly as possible? So let's, let's go. Let's do it. Silk, 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 silk. Okay, now answer this question for me, please. What does a cow drink? Now, if your first thought that came to you was milk, well, that was wrong because a cow drinks water. So chances that it are that you answered milk, but the cow really drink water. And what happened was that through that repetition, your brain was primed to with the sound ilk, and therefore you made the association when uh, with the question with the word milk. So this may have happened to you or not. This is a phenomenon called anchoring in, in behavioral finance, where you are uh, uh, your your response is anchored on a sort of reference point. So what is mindlessness? Harvard University researchers have shown that people on average spend almost 47% of their waking hours thinking about something different than what they're supposed to be doing and what they actually uh, are, are uh, doing in the current situation they're in. And what they're also finding is that this wandering of the mind uh, makes them generally unhappy. Um, why? Because typically the kind of thoughts that they have are not necessarily pleasing thoughts. And what is mindlessness, therefore? Mindlessness is about being on automatic pilot. We are not quite here with, you know, the current circumstances. Our body is there, but our mind may not be there. Our thoughts keep us mostly either in the past or in the future, or we're just reacting to outside circumstances based on habitual patterns. That is what mobilizes our, our brain most of the time. So how does that impact, you know, what is mindlessness and what does that, why does it happen? So maybe the sources of mindlessness have to do with uh, the brain's bandwidth capacity. This is a, a drawing by Gary Larson where the small brain, uh, the small head person says, Mr. Osborne, may I be excused? My brain is full. So that may be kind of a a joke and uh, uh, an analogy to what's happening with actually our brains. So in 2006, researchers at Pennsylvania School of Medicine estimated that the human retina can transmit visual 
input roughly equal to 10 million bits per second, which is equivalent to, at the time, an Ethernet connection. And the other senses add another million bits of information. So we are potentially able to process about 11 million bits of information. However, our brain can only uh, process about 100, 120 bits per second. So that's about, um, you know, uh, one, uh, 100,000 uh, times less than uh, what the amount of information that is coming to us is. So, for example, if we are to be talking to a person that mobilizes about 60 bits uh, of information per second, and that means that if our brain can handle 120, we can only have about a conversation with two people without uh, being overloaded with information. So the brain contains about 86 billion neurons. Each neuron contains, uh, uh, creates about 1,000 connections, so it's 86 tracks trillion connections and each neuron is ca capable of firing close to uh, once a millisecond but average activity is only four times a second so again why is there this limitation a possible answer is about energy consumption because the brain makes up only uh, about two percent of body mass but consumes about 20 percent of our energy um, it has to, uh, in a way, uh, self-monitor uh, the energy intake, and it can't be um, processing too much information, otherwise it would mobilize too much energy, and that is a potential answer. So what it has led to is a way of trying to uh, cope with reality and information by using what we call, what psychologists call heuristics, which are um, short mental shortcuts that enable us to cope with uh, outside reality, but those mental shortcuts are not perfect, and sometimes we make mistakes. So when, if we look at the evolution of the human brain, we see that the evolution is in three steps. We have the, the, uh, the um, reptilian brain down there, which is the, uh, the first, the most ancient part of the brain. And then on top of it, the limbic system, which is the, uh, this part here, and essentially uh, is the part that regulates emotions. And then the most modern part of the brain, uh, which is the, uh, the, the, the cerebral cort cortex and the neocortex, uh, is the one that is the more sophisticated in terms of imagination, thinking, uh, being able to project in the future and so on and so forth. <clears throat> so if we look at the way the brain uh, uh, generates emotions in the body, it, it takes place through the agency of, um, of glands that secretes particular hormones. So the hypothalamus and pituitary glands, for example, they send and receive hormones. Traumatic experience can sensitize the limbic uh, system and cause cortisol spikes. And this cortisol is secreted by the hypothalamus. On the other hand, the, uh, the pituitary gland, which is another part, another gland, is also responsible for producing oxytocin, which is called the love molecule. So you have glands producing different types of chemicals that, that will generate various types of emotions in the body. The amygdala is the gland that is responsible for the fear response. And uh, these emotional states can, be, can uh, be created without consciousness and may lead us to act without awareness. It can save our lives because we, uh, you know, we lived in a world a uh, long time ago where you know, we were, um, you know, there were predators around and we had to uh, respond to danger in a fairly rapid way. Uh, and this is this this gland is responsible for this kind of flat flight or fight responses. So the hippocampus is the master puzzle assembler, linking separated regions of the brain to convert moment-to-moment -moment experiences in memories. That's another uh, gland. The frontal lobe 
is associated with most complex think thinking and planning. And the prefrontal cortex makes representations of present, past, and future plans, and uh, moral judgments and uh, mind maps. Finally, the pineal, the pineal and pituitary glands, they are also often in, in some uh, spiritual traditions associated with higher consciousness experiences. The pineal secretes serotonin and melatonin that are also called the happy hormones. So in a way, the, the question is, once you have this awareness of these mechanisms in the brain, you know, how can you uh, be able to re regulate these uh, secretions of particular types of chemicals that can help you feel a certain way? So finally, let's just take a look of one of the emotions which we're going to uh, talk more about, especially in the context of, of finance and financial markets, and this is fear. And so what's happening is when there's fear that's been triggered, um, you know, it starts with the, um, um, uh, the hypothalamus where the fight and flight response is activated. The messages are sent to the kidneys, the adrenal glands, which release stress hormones. And um, the, um, the frontal and the, the temporal lobes, um, they, um, where experience of dread occurs, they release chemicals like dopamine that can cause panic and irrational behavior. And the hippocampus and the amygdala uh, establish situational emotional context and officially deem the situation as fearful, which then shuts down um, a little bit of the logical brain and uh, we are taken over by um, automatic response reactions. So we'll talk more about this in the next presentation. Thank you very much.